Hi everyone, and this is Matt Tu's show at Intro Stats, and today we're talking about a very famous theorem called the Central Limit Theorem. So we've kind of been going through this uh, little uh, investigation of sampling distributions lately. We've done a video on sort of the theory of sampling distributions. We, we looked at uh, using technology, using StatKey to create sampling distributions. And we also started to investigate when sampling distributions might be normal. So um, let's get right into it. So the central limit theorem is really a theorem about when is a sampling distribution normal? When is that sampling distribution going to look normal? Now traditionally in a stat book, the central limit theorem usually is stated in terms of the sample means. So a sampling distribution of the sample means, but it actually applies to sample proportions as well. So um, why is that important? Why would it be important for a sampling distribution to be normal? Well, there's actually quite a few good reasons. Um, mainly is a lot of the uh, traditional formulas, um, a lot of the traditional formulas um, use um, against standard error. And um, the standard error, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, remember is standard deviation is only accurate when data is normal. So this would only be accurate when the sampling distribution is normal. Also, we'll be using z-scores, a lot of those formulas use z-scores, or later we'll see t-scores, which are also based on normal sampling distributions. So there's a lot of reasons why a lot of the sort of more advanced formulas that we'll get to in this unit uh, really require a normal sampling distribution. Okay, so let's start with what is the central limit theorem, right? What does the central limit theorem tell us? So the central limit theorem... Um, says that a sampling distribution for sample means or sample proportions will be normal if the sample size is sufficiently large. And that statement is kind of loaded. It's kind of a loaded theorem that a lot of people read that and they don't sort of get the idea of it. Um, the main thing is that if your data is large enough, right, if, you, if your sample size is large enough, if you collected enough data in your sample, then the sampling distribution is likely to look normal. Um, so we kind of saw that last time when we looked at StatKey and we started investigating creating sampling distributions. And what we saw was as we increased the sample size, we collected more data, what happened was that the standard error got smaller. So every time we went from a sample size of 10, standard error was kind of big and the data may not, the sampling distribution didn't necessarily look normal. But then as we increased the sample size and, and used more data, the standard error went down. And what we saw the effect that had was that the sampling distribution started to look more and more normal. So it's very interesting. So that's a, that's a really good idea of how the central limit theorem works, right? More data I collect, the smaller the standard error gets, the more normal the sampling distribution looks. And so the central limit theorem basically states that the sampling distribution will look normal if your sample size is sufficiently large. Well, that's great, but what does that actually mean in practicality? What is sufficiently large for sample means or sample proportions? Well, I think I mentioned it in the last video. When the sampling distribution for sample means is normal, when is it normal? So we'll start with sample means. There's sort of two cases. If the population was skewed, which is the example we looked at, um, we really want the sample size to be at least 30. Okay, so that's kind of standard, was we want it to be 30 or above. Uh, when we used a sample size of 10 from a skewed population in our last video, we saw that the sampling distribution still looked skewed. But when I got to 30 or above, the sampling distribution started to look more and more normal. Now, I don't want you to think that any statistician or data scientist is happy about 30, okay? 30 is still a very small data set, and the less data you have, the more error you will have. So we'd much rather have a random sample of 100 or a random sample of, of uh, 200 or 500. But just realize that it is that the sampling, that this is not a question about... Um, this is the question about when will the sampling distribution look normal, and it turns out that if you, as long as your sample size was 30 or above, when you're dealing with sample means, the sampling distribution does tend to look pretty normal. Now, what happens if the population was already normal? 
So if the population was already normal, then the sampling distribution will be normal also, even if we go lower than 30. So um, if you remember, when a popula if the population was normal, the, sta the, the standard deviation of the population, and then you have the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, right? The standard error. So the standard error is always going to be smaller than this standard deviation of the population. Remember, the lower the standard error gets, the more normal it gets. So the sampling distribution is always going to look a little bit um, more normal than the original population. So if you translate that logically, if the population was already normal, the sampling distribution is going to look normal even if we had a very, very small sample size. Again, this is not an invitation to use tiny, tiny sample sizes. But it does tell us that we can get away with a smaller sample size if our population was normal. So this is where we get a very, very famous assumption when in inferential statistics when we're estimating population means. So any kind of technique that estimates population means, usually you'll see that they want the sample data to be normal or have a sample size n of at least 30. So sometimes we call that the 30 or normal requirement. It's very famous whenever you're dealing with sample means, and it comes really from the central limit there. Okay, so 30 are normal if you're dealing with sample means. Um, by the way, that would mean that if I had a data that was like 23, but the sample when I made a histogram looked bell-shaped, it'd be okay. Um, if, I, um, if I had a data set where my histogram looked very skewed left, but my sample size was 50, I'd be okay. So it is an or statement. So it's important to remember that's an or statement. It doesn't mean both things have to be true, one or the other. Either the data has to look normal or the sample size has to be at least 30. Now, what about proportions? Proportions are a little more complicated. It's actually, means are pretty straightforward, but proportions are very complicated uh, mainly because no set sample size works. You, don't, you can't say always 50 is going to work or always 100 is going to work. It doesn't really work that way. So what we saw was uh, when we were doing the last video, we saw that uh, in a couple of the examples we looked at, 10 was too small. The sampling distribution for proportion still looked skewed. Uh, but then when I went to 100, 100 seemed to work. Right? 100 seemed to work. So why was that? Why did that work that way? I think we looked at the graduation percentage, and the graduation population graduation percentage was about 0.275 or so. So in general, this is sort of the rule that statisticians and data scientists came up with a long time ago for, normal, for, for determining if a sampling distribution for sample proportions looks normal. So basically, it's what we call the 10 successes, 10 failures rule. You have to have at least 10 successes in your categorical data. Remember, proportions goes with percentages from categorical data. So you have to have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. So sometimes you'll see in stat books, it'll say x is greater than or equal to 10, or n minus x has to be greater than or equal to 10. Both of those things, it's not an or statement, that both of those things have to be true. So if you're dealing with smoking data, I'm trying to feel what percentage of people smoke cigarettes. Well, I'd have to have a data set where I had at least 10 people smoke cigarettes and at least 10 people did not smoke cigarettes. Okay, so if I only have three people in my data set that smoke, the sampling distribution is not going to look normal. If I only had uh, five people that do not smoke, the sampling distribution is not going to look normal. So we call that the 10 successes and 10 failures rule. So in general, if you're dealing with data, now if you've already collected the data or you're just looking at a sample data, a random sample, just check is there 10 successes and 10 failures. So if I looked at the, if I had graduation data that was already done for me and I had already, look, I was just looking at it, uh, maybe I was going to use it in a technique to estimate populations or something, then I would just need to check was there at least 10 people that graduated in the data and at least 10 people that did not graduate in the data. So that's what we call the 10 successes, 10 failures. You need 10 or more, hopefully more. You know, we actually want, we don't get, we don't, we actually get uncomfortable if it gets close to 10. We actually would love it to be like, you know, a lot more than 10. So you need at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. 
Now, what happens if you're actually trying to collect data? Um, and that, be, that becomes collecting categorical data can be somewhat of an issue sometimes because there's no set sample size necessarily. It's not like, oh, N always has to be, I always have to collect data from 50 people. Uh, that may not work. You might collect data from 50 people and still not have 10 successes and 10 failures. So um, these are some sort of general guidelines. So let's suppose that our population graduation rate was 0.275. This was the example we looked at in uh, the last video. And because you want at least 10 successes, um, you can actually go ahead and use that proportion to sort of estimate what your sample size should be. So if I, if I look at this formula, n equals 10 divided by pi, remember pi is the population percentage or population proportion, 0.275 in this case. And then this would be for a number of failures, 10 divided by 1 minus pi. And you really do it twice, you do both of these formulas, and then you take the larger of the two, because it's got to satisfy both. So if I plug these in, you can kind of see what happens. Uh, if I do n equals 10 divided by 0.275, I get 36.3636. Now, in terms of sample size requirements, you never want to be too small. If I, go, if I went with 36, I would technically be too small. So I always want to round up when you're dealing with sample size. So if you're talking about how many people should I collect data, always round up. Yes, even if it was, you know, 25.1, I would round that to 26, because 25.1 means 25 is going to be too small. Um, so I rounded this up, this one up, 10 divided by 0.275 is, is 36.36, but I rounded it up to 37. So to get at least 10 people that graduate, I need to have at least 37 people in my data. Now, but I need at least 10 people that did not graduate. So 10 divided by 1 minus pi, pi again was 0.275, those would be given to you in the problem, or it might be something that somebody estimated a while back. So 10 divided by 1 minus 0.275 is 13.79, again I'm going to round up. So I'm going to round that to 14. So to get 10 successes I need a sample size of 37. To get a